of Africana Philosophy by Chika Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, I Read Men and Nations, Sojourner Truth and Francis Harper. Some years ago, I was on the radio to talk about the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus. I was asked to discuss his most famous saying, which states that different waters flow over those who step into the same rivers. I read out the Greek text to make the point that in the original, the saying is onomatopoeic, since it actually sounds like flowing water. The host of the show was so taken with this that he asked me to read out the Greek again, which I gladly did, leading to one of my great regrets, because it was only later that day that I realized I could have said, there, I've just shown it's possible to read out the same river fragment twice. That's something we've all experienced coming up with the perfect comment or retort only once it's too late. It happens even to people with much greater rhetorical gifts, like, of all people, Frederick Douglass. Speaking at a public meeting in 1852, he gave vent to his frustration at the obstacles put in the way of black progress, and thundered that violence rather than moral suasion might be needed if black people were to secure their rights. Then a deep voice came from the front row, saying simply, Frederick, is God dead? The entire audience was stunned as if by an electric shock, and Douglas himself was reduced to silence by this moralizing rebuke. It came from Sojourner Truth, who, alongside Douglas, is now the most famous of the African American abolitionists. This anecdote was included in The Book of Life, a collection of anecdotes and documents appended to the much read narrative of her life. It was also related by Douglas himself. Decades later, He admitted that Sojourner's intervention brought the event to a standstill, as if someone had thrown a brick through the window. This is also confirmed by a contemporary report in the abolitionist press. But in the third and last of his autobiographies, Douglas took the liberty of giving himself a snappy comeback. When Truth asked whether God was dead, he supposedly answered, No, and because God is not dead, slavery can only end in blood. Whatever the truth of this confrontation between Douglas and, well, Truth, it invites us to consider these two figures alongside one another. Both former slaves, both active as public speakers in the campaign against slavery, and then for decades after its abolition, both made famous by narratives setting down their life stories, they were in fact also both torn as to the necessity of violence. Truth was a powerfully religious and moralizing thinker, but occasionally wielded the fiery rhetoric we have seen in David Walker, as when she said, I do not want any man to be killed, but I am sorry to see them so short-minded. But we'll have our rights, see if we don't, and you can't stop us from them, see if you can. This remark, like everything else Sojourner Truth is known to have said, was preserved by other witnesses, in this case of a lecture she gave in New York City in 1853. She was famously illiterate, having grown up in New York State as the uneducated slave of a Dutch-speaking family, so that English was also her second language. Truth said herself that when she first came to New York City, her English was still poor, and she was ignorant as a horse. She had literally walked to freedom, after her master, John Dumont, reneged on a promise to free her after a certain period of time, on the grounds that a hand injury had prevented her from doing her full work. When Dumont caught up with her, he grudgingly agreed to sell her to a family with whom she had found shelter, the Van Wageners. But Dumont sold Truth's son, Peter, to another family, who then broke New York law by selling Peter into the South. Truth contested this in court, insisting with terse determination, I'll have my child again. Incredibly, she was successful in stopping the sale, and her son was returned to her. She had been rewarded twice for her courage and perceptive grasp of what was possible, even to her as a slave with no resources but a profound sense of justice and faith in God. As she once put it, I don't read such small stuff as letters, I read men and nations. All this happened in 1826, early in Truth's long and eventful life, which stretched from her birth, right around the end of the 18th century, to her death in 1883. We have a detailed account of her early experiences in the aforementioned narrative, which was, of course, not set down by Truth herself, but by a white abolitionist named Olive Gilbert. A friend of William Lloyd Garrison, Gilbert met Truth 
through the Northampton Association of Education and Industry, a utopian community in Massachusetts which, it has been said, was treated by Garrison and Frederick Douglass as a sort of progressive summer camp. The fact that it was Gilbert who wrote the narrative makes this biography of truth unlike those of Douglass, which, as we saw, were very emphatically written by himself. Throughout, it speaks of truth in the third person, and Gilbert editorializes and comments on the story as she goes along. But it's also clear that Truth has had a hand in shaping the story of her life. Already before telling that story to Gilbert, she had decided to call herself Sojourner Truth, having originally been called Isabella. The new name, she said, was given to her by God. And her involvement in the composition of the narrative itself is clear at certain points, as when Gilbert remarks of one anecdote that it is a comparatively trifling incident she wishes related. This turns out to be one of the more famous passages in the narrative in which Truth was scolded for serving up grayish potatoes, and it turned out that another servant had been spilling ash into the cooking water. Her insistence on including this anecdote shows Truth's eye for the telling detail and humble parable. Her homespun and disarmingly direct rhetorical style made it easy for reporters, even admiring ones, to diminish her with rather patronizing descriptions. Douglas wrote of her, She was a genuine specimen of the uncultured Negro, she cared very little for elegance of speech or refinement of manners. She seemed to please herself and others best when she put her ideas in the oddest forms. Her quaint speeches easily gave her an audience. Here, Douglas subtly puts truth in her place, implicitly contrasting his own more polished style to that of a woman who was both a cherished ally and a potential rival for attention and acclaim. Like Douglas, truth spent much of her life as an itinerant lecturer, appearing in cities all over America to decry slavery, and, after abolition, to exhort audiences, both white and black, both male and female, to assist the population of freed slaves. She especially focused on the cause of free land grants in the western United States, submitting an official petition for this cause to the U.S. Congress. This was, to her mind, a far preferable solution to black poverty than emigration to Liberia. In the many press reports of her speeches and public appearances, Truth was reliably presented as a kind of naive sage, and sometimes explicitly called a philosopher, to mark this status. This is clear from the representation of her persona and her speech in Gilbert's narrative and in other contemporary documents, many of which were collected by a Quaker woman named Frances Gage in the aforementioned Book of Life that she added to the narrative. That title, Book of Life, had been used by Truth for a keepsake volume of signatures from people she had met, including Abraham Lincoln. In these documents and contemporary newspapers, we have a reminder of the contrast between philosophy in oral and in written contexts, which was one of our abiding themes earlier in this series. Many stories about Truth show her in conversational settings or responding to others in a witty or penetrating fashion, like her comment at Douglas's speech or on the occasion when she met Lincoln. When the president showed her a Bible sent him by the black population of Baltimore, she praised its beauty and then added, The colored people have given this to the head of the government, and that government once sanctioned laws that would not permit its people to learn enough to enable them to read this book. And for what? Let them answer who can. In this case, the report of her remark is written out in standard English, but frequently reports about her employ irregular spelling to mark her dialect. In a report of her public lecturing taken from a Boston newspaper and included in the Book of Life, it's related how she got a laugh with the following reminiscence. I said, oh God, my mother told me if I asked you to make my master and mistress good, you'd do it, and they didn't get good. Why, says I, God, maybe you can't do it. Kill em. I haven't attempted to pronounce this in her supposed dialect the way it's written, but to give you some idea, in the words, told me if... Told is spelled T-O-L-E, and if is spelled E-F, the word master is written marster, and so on. This is liable to distract us from the deep significance of the anecdote. Like Douglas looking back on his growing understanding of slavery as a youth, she here recalls a precocious concern with the problem of evil. Why does God allow the tyranny of slavery? And with somewhat morbid humor, alludes to the question of whether this tyranny should be met with violence. The typographical markers of Truth's uneducated speaking style were mirrored in explicit descriptions of her as a lecturer, as with the example we just saw in Douglas or this account from a Rochester paper 
She is unable to read or write, and in her manner and style is perfectly natural and original. She acts and speaks with the simplicity and innocence of a child, and seems to have nothing to conceal. Another press report is somewhat more nuanced. Her matter and manner were simply indescribable, often straying far away from the starting point, but each digression was fraught with telling logic, rough humor, or effective sarcasm. More insightful still, an English journalist named Gilbert Vale, who interviewed Truth, said that she is not exactly what she seems. She had her own or private opinion on everything, and these opinions of her own we have frequently found very correct. These issues of representation are vividly on display in the two most famous accounts of Sojourner Truth, which come to us from the Ohio activist Francis Gage and Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Stowe wrote a piece about Truth which appeared in the Atlantic Monthly in 1863, the year of the Emancipation Proclamation. It styles Sojourner as a Libyan Sibyl and consists in part of an interview in which Stowe's questions are in standard English and Truth's in extravagantly marked dialect. It repeats the story of Truth's escape from slavery and dwells on her conversion to a deeply felt Christianity. A key insight came after God inspired her to set out for freedom when she came to realization of his omnipresence, saying, Oh God, I didn't know you were so big. The same story appears in the narrative, in which Olive Gilbert emphasizes that Truth herself looks back on her earlier religious beliefs as ignorant and simplistic, like the dark imagery of a fitful dream. Stowe's presentation is fond but rather condescending, and makes for a vivid contrast with the personality depicted by Frances Gage in her report of Truth's most renowned speech, which was given in Akron, Ohio, in 1851. As one modern-day scholar has commented, while Stowe drew Truth as a quaint, minstrel-like 19th-century Negro, Gage made her into a tough-minded feminist emblem by stressing Truth's strength and the clash of conventions of race and gender, and by the riveting refrain, and aren't I a woman? This is indeed the most famous line in the speech, and it is worth quoting the passage in full. I think that twixt the N-word of the South and the women of the North all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there say that that woman needs to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever held me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place, and aren't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. Here, Gage adds, and she bared her right arm to the shoulder, showing her tremendous muscular power. The speech continues, and I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me, and aren't I a woman? And I could work as much and eat as much as a man, when I could get it, and bear the lash as well, and aren't I a woman? I have borne thirteen children, and seen the most all sold off into slavery, and when I cried out with a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard, and aren't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. What's this they call it? Intellect, whispered someone near. That's it, honey. What's that got to do with women's rights or N-words rights? If my cup won't hold but a pint and yours holds a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half-measure full? As in Stowe, Truth's words are written out in unconventional spelling to mark her dialect. Great emphasis is placed upon her physical forcefulness, her almost Amazon form, and a voice like rolling thunder. Here, one may have the uncomfortable feeling that Gage reduces Truth to a kind of simple-minded figure whose power comes from the strength of her black body rather than her mind. Truth herself seems to be undermining that construal in the speech, as she emphasizes the importance of her mind in her claim to rights. And by the way, Contemporary reports of this speech found in newspapers write out the pint and quart remark in conventional English and do not have her needing help to come up with the word intellect. In fact, Truth's strategy seems to have been more complicated and self-knowing. She understood that her audience would see her in terms of her body and what it had endured, and she manipulated those attitudes for rhetorical effect. On another famous occasion, while speaking in Indiana, she would suspect it of being a man because of her deep voice. She informed her white male accusers that, as a slave, she had been required to nurse white baby boys. Then, bearing her breasts, she asked them if they wished to suckle from them. It's hard to imagine a more dramatic reversal of the prevailing power dynamics, reminding members of the dominant race and gender that they have sometimes been vulnerable and dependent for their very survival 
on a black woman. As the speech in Akron and this anecdote reveal, Truth was extraordinary in her insight into the plight of black women and the parallel between the repression of black people and of women. She saw the campaign for women's rights as a kind of extension of the struggle against slavery. In another example of her rather ambiguous views on violence, never to be welcomed but perhaps to be acknowledged as necessary, she said after emancipation that freedom for black people had come through blood, adding, I am sorry it came in that way. We are now trying for liberty that requires no blood, that women shall have their rights. Of course, we know already that Truth was not the only woman to speak out on these issues. She herself said, I suppose that I am about the only colored woman that goes about to speak for the rights of the colored woman. But her famous refrain, aren't I a woman, is reminiscent of Maria Stewart's earlier rhetorical question, what if I am a woman? And she was not in fact the only African American woman in this period to make public lectures or to link the causes of racial and sexual equality. One of the more prominent of her fellow activists was Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Her biography makes for a sharp contrast with that of truth. Born free in 1825 and orphaned at a young age, she grew up with her uncle, William Watkins, in Baltimore. Watkins was himself a significant figure in African-American letters. He founded an Academy of Negro Youth and was himself highly educated, having proficiency in classical languages and medicine. He also published essays in Garrison's Liberator and sometimes wrote under the pen name of The Colored Baltimorean. He's singled out under this name in no less a work than David Walker's Appeal as a judicious opponent of the colonization scheme. Thanks to Watkins, his niece, Frances, got an excellent education and put it to good use. Like Phyllis Wheatley before her, she wrote publishable poetry from a fairly young age, and like her contemporary, Martin Delaney, she gave public lectures and wrote novels. Her poetry is more overtly political than Wheatley's. It often focuses on the perspective of black women, for instance, describing a runaway slave. She is a mother, her child is a slave, and she'll give him his freedom or find him a grave. In another poem about a slave auction, she writes, And mothers stood with streaming eyes, and saw their dearest daughters sold, unheeded rose their bitter cries, while tyrants bartered them for gold. This focus on the plight of women is also thematized in one of her more famous speeches, We Are All Bound Up Together, given in 1866 in New York at the National Women's Rights Convention. She speaks of the devastating consequences for her family when her husband died, leaving her with four children to care for. Had she been a man, she could simply have remarried, but instead she was left in precarious circumstances, losing all her property but a looking glass. This passage is typical of her writing. The detail about the mirror metaphorically suggests that even in such dire straits, she's left with a kind of self-knowledge that escapes her oppressors. On the other hand, she makes frank emotional appeals to her audience, in this case pointing to the sort of vulnerability that also affected Maria Stewart when her own husband died. As Michael Stancliffe has written in a book-length study of Harper, her speech showed that when husbands and other male guardians die, Black women are forced into a realization of their status as property. As we can see from the fact that she was speaking at a convention for women's rights, Harper was active in this movement, as well as advocating for abolition and, after the Civil War, radical reconstruction in the South. Like Frederick Douglass, she was willing to prioritize Black voting rights above those of women. She said, When it was a question of race, I let the lesser question of sex go, but the white women all go for sex. As for her own view, she would not have the black woman put a single straw in the way if only the men of the race could obtain what they wanted. To white suffragists who were insufficiently alive to the plight of African Americans, she said, You white women speak here of rights, I speak of wrongs. I, as a colored woman, have had in this country an education which has made me feel as if I were in the situation of Ishmael, my hand against every man and every man's hand against me. In keeping with this, Harper was aware that voting rights were only a step towards genuine liberation. She used her eloquence to promote domestic stability in the black community, as in this passage, the colored man needs something more than a vote in his hand. He needs to know the value of home life, to rightly appreciate the value of the marriage relation, to know how and be incited to leave behind him the old shards and shells of slavery, and to rise in the scale of character, wealth, and influence. <laughs> 
She was also a prominent supporter of temperance, writing such poems as The Drunkard's Child to call attention to the dangers of alcohol. Note again her focus on the way that societal evils manifest themselves in the domestic sphere, also a constant refrain of her remarks on racial injustice, as when she said that failure in reconstruction would lead to trouble in every parlor and every kitchen. All this may suggest that, like Maria Stewart, she focused mostly on moral exhortation. But, like Sojourner Truth, she also had an eye on economic policy. She was a determined proponent of the Free Produce Movement, a campaign to boycott goods made with slave labor. In this context, she perceptibly asked, could slavery exist long if it did not sit on a commercial throne? More generally, Francis Harper and Sojourner Truth make for an interesting contrast. They had similar political aims, moved in the same circles, and both appeared at women's rights events. But we've seen how reports about Truth constantly called attention to her humble origins and unpolished speech. By contrast, a newspaper account of a lecture by Harper said that she has a splendid articulation, uses chaste, pure language, has a pleasant voice, and allows no one to tire of hearing her. Whereas Sojourner Truth was known for her performance of folksy, if politically pointed, songs, Harper was known for her artful poetry. It's hard to imagine Truth alluding, as Harper did, to the dying words of Goethe, or the political situation in contemporary Russia. Most obviously, where Truth was famously illiterate, Harper was above all a literary figure, an author of such productions as a book-length poem about Moses, whom she considered the first disunionist for his leadership of the slave population in Egypt. In fact, whereas truth was regularly quoted in dialect, represented by unorthodox spellings and grammar, Harper used this device herself as an author, in works like Sketches of Southern Life, a collection of poetry and a short story published in 1872, and her novel Iola Leroy, which appeared in 1892. Harper was, in fact, long thought of as the first African-American woman to write a novel until the rediscovery in the 1980s of Harriet Wilson's Our Nig from 1859. Scholars have credited Harper with employing in her narrative writings a relatively naturalistic way of using spelling to convey real black speech and with varying this technique from one character to another. She also shows characters doing what we would nowadays call code switching, varying between dialect and standard English. Ultimately, then, while Truth and Harper can both be thought of as, among other things, philosophers, this is true in rather different senses. We saw that contemporaries did call Truth a philosopher, meaning by this that she fell into a long tradition of figures who critique hypocrisy and moral and political failings by the example of their own lives and through barbed wit. A striking parallel from the ancient world might be Socrates, or even better, Diogenes the Cynic, who called his society to account through face-to-face confrontation rather than writing. Actually, at one point, the resonances with Diogenes are almost uncanny. A report about truth says of her that, cosmopolitan in nature, she calls the world her home, just as Diogenes famously proclaimed that he was a citizen of the world. Harper, by contrast, was didactic in her approach, and frequently articulated the philosophical principles underlying the causes for which she campaigned. She explained the need to educate and liberate women by saying, It is one of women's most sacred rights to have the privilege of forming the symmetry and adjusting the mental balance of an immortal mind. Her remarks on political philosophy include such fundamental observations as this one. A government that can protect its citizens and will not is a vicious government. A government that would protect its citizens and cannot is a weak government. In her 1891 speech, Duty to Dependent Races, she sounds like a modern-day liberal theorist when she argues, The strongest nation on earth cannot afford to deal unjustly towards its weakest and feeblest members. But it was precisely these contrasting styles that made both women such formidable figures in the struggle against oppression. We've seen how Frederick Douglass seems to have been uneasy in the face of Sojourner Truth because of what another contemporary called her humorous, common-sense style. Another activist was more explicit in admitting her reluctance to appear alongside Harper, conceding that, Wisdom obliges me to keep out of the way, as with her prepared lectures, there would be no chance of a favorable comparison. But the woman who said that was no slouch herself. She ran her own newspaper, making her the first African-American woman publisher, 
and she added her own voice to those of Truth and Harper in the fight against injustice. Her name was Mary Ann Shad, and she published her newspaper, The Provincial Freeman, in Canada, to which she emigrated and encouraged other African Americans to go as well. Alongside Frances Harper, the example of Shad will show us that the contributions of Black women in this period were not nothing but the truth. Next time here on the History of African Philosophy. I'm gonna tell God all.